Okay, we're continuing with chapter three of the calculus textbook. In this video, we're going through section 3.7, which is the rates of change in natural and social sciences, or as I'm titling this video, derivatives in the real world. And so if you aren't a math major, which means that the reason you learn math is primarily so you can hopefully apply it somehow in your dedicated field of study, engineering, biology, science, physics, chemistry, then this section is really applicable to you. So in this section, what we do is we talk about how the derivative is applied in different fields. But as we go through this section, don't get too bogged down with the physical concepts we're talking about in that specific field. What you want to focus on and what I'm going to try and highlight is just how the derivative is applied to real life situations, to situations outside of math. Okay, so it says we know that if y is equal to f of x, then the derivative dy dx can be interpreted as the rate of change of y with respect to x. In this section, we're going to examine some of the applications. And so, okay, to sum all of this up, if we come here, this form of the derivative here, if you remember back in section 2.7, that was when we were first introduced to the derivative, the definition of the derivative. We looked at how there were different forms of the, of the derivative. You could come up with the general definition for the derivative with different approaches. Like, so if we look here, we, we had like the point was A and, and, it was the, and the second point was H away from A. And we said the limit as H approached zero, right? There were different ways you could write the derivative. This was one of the ways. And so if you set it up this way, you have, you have X1 and X2 and then the point at x1, so it's x1, f of x1, and then, x, and then the point at x2, x2, f of x2. The derivative dy dx is the limit as delta x approaches zero of delta y over delta x. We call this delta y over delta x the difference quotient, right? Delta y is f of x2 minus f of x1. Delta x is x2 minus x1. And the difference quotient is the average rate of change of y with respect to x over the interval x1 to x2, whereas the derivative is the instantaneous rate of change of y with respect to x. For non-math majors, this is the main form of the definition of the derivative that you want to be familiar with. Don't get me wrong, they're all important, right? The classic definition, the limit as h approaches zero of f of a plus h minus f of a over h, that's just the derivative at its most fundamental. That's important too, but for applications outside of calculus, this is the form that's most commonly applied. You think of the derivative as the rate of change of one variable with respect to the rate of change of another variable. It's easy for non-math majors while they're learning calculus and, and then after they, they finish calculus, this doesn't even cross their mind. But like in scientific journals, when calculus is used, you see this a lot. You see this form a lot. So, okay, let's take a look at this first application. If S is a function of T, so S is, is a position function. So you have the position of something as a function of time. I think for me, when I was going through calculus, going through the early stages of engineering, in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, well, where do you get a position function like this? Okay, because obviously what we're going to do is, like, if, if you've got this position as a function of time, you can take the derivative with respect to time to get the velocity, because what is velocity? is change in position with respect to time, right? And then what is acceleration? Change in acceleration with respect to time. So then you, so you, could, you, you take the first derivative, you get the velocity, you take the second derivative, you get the acceleration. Okay, but where do you get a position function like this? Well, the first thing to note is, remember that for this application here, and for any of the applications we're going to talk about in this section, if we have a derivative, then the function that, that we're taking the derivative of, it must be differentiable, right? We know what differentiable means. It's like a, it's, it's a smooth, continuous curve, at least in the region that we're, that we're differentiating. So just keep that in mind. Anytime you see a derivative, underlying that is this smooth, differentiable curve. Okay, but again, so where would you get a position function? Well, okay, let's think about a roller coaster. If you want the position of the roller coaster at any moment in time, well, the 
X, Y, and Z coordinates are like they're exactly the same for each run of the roller coaster. You've got the exact same X, Y, and Z coordinates at any moment in time, right? So the roller coaster maybe comes up and then turns off, goes towards the back. Right, the progression of the X, Y, and Z coordinates is the exact same for each run. But what you need to know is what is the X coordinate as a function of time? What is the Y coordinate as a function of time? What is the Z coordinate as a function of time? Well, there's different data collection devices to where you can collect the position of the roller coaster with a high frequency, you know, 50 data points per second. You could know the coordinates of the roller coaster at each point in time. Now, a bunch of points on a graph. That's not differentiable, but you could do a curve fit. Now, you don't do a curve fit on the entire roller coaster ride. There's no, there's no curve that's like naturally shaped just like this. You, you break it up into pieces. So here, on, on the rise, you do a linear curve fit. Here, you do like a, a parabolic curve fit or maybe a, a radial, radial curve fit. Here, you do another linear curve fit. Here you do another, you know, w w whatever. And you piece those curve fits together. And you can differentiate a line, a parabola, another line, uh, whatever, you know, whatever the curve is, right? And so you could have something like this. S, the position as a function of time is this, this is a, this is a polynomial. This is differentiable, right? Definitely this is differentiable. Okay, so we're going to work some example problems, but you know, find the velocity at time t. How do you do that? Just take the derivative. What is the velocity after two seconds, after four seconds? Just plug t is equal to two and t, t is equal to four into the velocity function. When is the particle at rest? Set the velocity equal to zero and solve for t. Maybe you'll get two values of t or three values of t, right? That's, you're just solving a polynomial equation. If you set the velocity function, so that will be a second order polynomial, equal to zero, you're going to get two potential answers. When is the particle moving forward? That is in the positive direction. Take the velocity function and solve for when it's greater than zero. Draw a diagram to represent the motion of the particle. Well, this is just, you know, a particle moving in a straight line, right? This is one dimension. So if the velocity is positive, it's going in the positive s direction. If it's negative, it's going in the negative s direction. So you just need to know the intervals of when you need to know this. D, when is the particle moving forward in the positive direction or negative direction? Find the total distance traveled by the particle during the first five seconds. So the total distance, just pure distance, you just add up. This isn't the same as the displacement of the particle. So you don't say S of 5 minus S of 0, right? Because the particle could go forward and backward. S5 minus S0 could be zero, potentially, if the particle st comes is back where it started after five seconds. So you, what you need to do is, if we come here, the particle is moving in the positive direction from zero to one, negative from one to three, and positive from three to five. So from zero to one, what is S1 minus S0? What is the magnitude of that? Then what is the magnitude of S3 minus S1? And then what is the magnitude of S5 minus S3? And you add all those up. Find the acceleration at time t and after four seconds. That's the second derivative. And then just plug in t is equal to four. Graph the position, velocity, and acceleration functions for time zero to five. Okay, here are the graphs. So the acceleration is, it's linear right? The acceleration is going to be, here's the acceleration, 6t minus 12, right? It's a line. Part i, okay, when is the particle speeding up? When is it slowing down? Speeding up, slowing down, what does that mean? If the particle is speeding up, then it's moving in the positive direction and accelerating in the positive direction, or it's moving in the negative direction and accelerating in the negative direction. So moving in the positive or negative direction, what does that mean? That's the velocity. So the velocity is positive, but the acceleration is negative, so it's slowing down here. Then in this region, 
up to here, whenever both the acceleration and the velocity are negative, it's speeding up in the negative direction. Then here, it's, it's moving in the negative direction, but accelerating in the positive direction, so it's slowing down. And then here, it's moving in the positive direction and accelerating in the positive direction, so it's speeding up. Okay, example two. If a rod or a piece of wire is homogeneous, then its linear density is uniform as, and is defined as the mass per unit length. Its linear density, a rod or piece of wire is linear density. If, if, the, if it's homogeneous, then just divide the mass by the length, and that's the linear density, mass per unit length. Usually you think of density as mass per unit volume, but for a wire or a rod, sometimes... It's, it's convenient to, to use mass per unit length. Suppose, however, that the rod is not homogeneous, but that its mass is measured from its left end to a point X. Mass is a function of X. So if we look here, the, the, it's saying like, okay, at X, that's the mass of all of this, all of this, the total mass of all of this, okay? You could be given a function for the mass of the rod, at x not it's not the mass at x like this it's it's the mass is a function of like the total mass at distance x like this mx this is the mass of all of this now again don't get too bogged down with the physical concepts behind what we're talking about just focus on how they're they're applying the derivative so, okay, the mass of the part of the rod that lies between x is equal to x1 and x is equal to x2 is given by f of x2 minus f of x1, right? The mass of this is just f of, f of x2 minus f of x1. So that the average density in that part of the rod is f of x2 minus f of x1 divided by that length, right? That's the, that's the average linear density, Right, we're talking about linear density here, mass per unit length. Okay, but what is this, though? This delta M divided by delta X, that's the difference quotient, right? That's what we talked about on the first page of this section. That's, that's the difference quotient. This is that most common form that, that's used to, to take a derivative in, in, the, in the real world, right? Because it says here, if we let delta X approach zero, then we are computing the average density over smaller and smaller intervals. The linear density row at x1 is the limit of these averages densities as delta x approaches zero, right? It's this. For a non-homogeneous rod or wire, the linear density is the limit as delta x approaches zero of delta m divided by delta x, which is what? The derivative of m with respect to x, right? So let me make sure you're understanding this. For a homogeneous rod, it's convenient to, to express the density as like a linear density. Instead of a, instead of a density, a, a mass per unit volume, they do mass per unit length. If it's, a, if it's a uniform homogeneous rod, you just take the mass divided by the length, and that's the linear density, rho. If you have a non-uniform rod, then the way they do it is they'll give a mass function, which is the total mass as a function of x, right? The, to the, the mass of this is what f of x is, that mass function. But if we want to find the mass in, in, in like a, in a, over a span here, we just say f of x2 minus f of x1, and that's, that's this mass. Now, if we take f of x2 minus f of x1 and, and divide that by x2 minus x1, you get a linear density, right? Mass divided by length but it's like the average linear density over a certain span of the, of the rod, delta M divided by delta X. But if you take the limit as delta X approaches zero of that, of that difference quotient, the limit as the denominator approaches zero, you get the derivative, dm dx. Well, that, that's mass per unit length. That's, you can say that's the linear density. Now, remember, we have a derivative here. How, how, is, how does this work? Well, you just need m to be differentiable. m as a function of x needs to be differentiable. It needs to be a smooth curve. 
then you can then then it's no problem to find DMDX. So as long as you're given a smooth curve, this M as a function of X is a smooth curve, you can get DMDX. And that's what they say here. If you have a mass function that's equal to the square root of X, well, you can get DMDX, no problem, the linear density. Okay, example three. A current exists whenever electric charges move. Figure six shows part of a wire and electrons moving through a plane surface, shaded red. Okay, so... So these electrons are moving through this plane surface here. If delta Q is the net charge that passes through this surface during a time period delta T, then the average current during this time interval is defined as, so the average current, delta Q divided by delta T. Right, we're talking in generalities right now. So we're not, we haven't defined any functions yet. We're just modeling the problem. So they're, they're just saying, look, we've got, these electrons going through this wire or, or this tube, however you want to look at it, what is current? So on average, you're going to have a certain amount of charge pass through this, this plane, this strictly this plane, a certain amount of electric charge in a, in a time period, right? That's going to be delta Q. Now you can divide that by delta T and that's current. So charge per time, right? That's what current is, charge per time. But okay, here's a difference quotient we can find well what is the limit as delta t approaches zero of this difference quotient that's defined as current and that's dq dt right if you can come up with a function that represents the amount of charge that has passed through this plane at any time t right that's the function q of t would be total charge that has passed through the plane at that time at t is equal to zero it's no charge t is equal to one it's more charge two three it's more and more charge dq dt if that's a smooth cur differentiable curve, dq dt is the current. So like, okay, t q. This is the amount of charge that has passed through the plane going from left to right. So as time increases, if this starts going up, more and more charge is going from left to right across that plane. This is the total, the total charge that's, that's crossed over the plane. Total. If this would start going down, what does that mean? Well, now charge is going from right to left. This doesn't have to be negative for charge to go from right to, from, from right to left. In fact, a negative value here doesn't make sense because you can't have like no charge, like less than no charge going through the plane. It's either zero or positive, this Q. So what is, if you take like delta Q, divided by delta T. That's like the average change in charge with respect to time crossing the plane. DQ DT is the current passing through that plane. Now you could have a negative Q if, if you set up the model differently than what I just did, but you, but you get the idea. Okay, example four, a chemical reaction results in the formation of one or more substances called products from one or more starting materials called reactants. For instance, the equation, so 2H2 plus O2 gives 2H2O, indicates that two molecules of hydrogen and one molecule of oxygen form two molecules of water. Let's consider the reaction. So A plus B gives C, where A and B are the reactants and C is the product. Right, so okay, they just, you know, they give us a chemical reaction here. We've got the reactants and products. Let's consider the reaction A plus B gives C, where A and B are the reactants and C is the product. The concentration of a reactant A is the number of moles per liter. So this is like taking place in solution and is denoted by, so this is the concentration of A. The concentration varies during a reaction. So the concentration of A, B, and C are all functions of time, right? So we're talking about derivatives here. So these concentrations of A, B, and C as functions of time, if we're dealing in derivatives, these are going to be or need to be differentiable. Right, and we and we we know differentiability. Most curves are going to be differentiable, right? As long as it's like as long as it's continuous and smooth, and then also just needs to be over the intervals that you're considering as well. It doesn't have to be for the entire function, just over the intervals you're considering. Then it's differentiable. Okay, the average rate of reaction of the product C over a time interval. Yeah, so uh, this is in in general articles and a lot of derivations. They'll 
they'll they'll do it this way. They'll first write out the difference quotient for something. So the change in concentration of C, and for and forget about time for the moment. Right, just the change in con uh, in concentration of C is equal to what? The concentration of C at time t two minus the concentration of C at time t one. That's just the change in concentration in, in, in C over a period of time. Well, if you want to find the change in concentration of C with respect to any variable, you just need to find the concentration of C as a function of that variable. Here we're talking about time. So they divide it by that delta T, T2 minus T1. That's this difference quotient. Take the limit as delta T approaches zero. That's the rate of the reaction, the derivative of C with respect to time. And so the functions, the, the concentration of C as a function of time is going to be differentiable. And if we come here, the rate of the reaction, you can, for, for the rate of the reaction, you can track the reactants or the products, in any one of the reactants or products, but you're going to have a negative in front of the reactants because those, why? Because those are, de those are decreasing. Those functions are decreasing. The concentration of A is decreasing with time. The concentration of B is decreasing with time. The concentration of C is increasing it with time. Okay, and then here they give it based on the number of moles. This is more like, you know, the chemically correct way of looking at it. Or no, it's, it, it depends on how you have the equation balanced, but that's, that's the idea. Okay, one of the quantities of interest in thermodynamics is compressibility. If a given substance is kept at constant temperature, then its volume V depends on its pressure P. We can consider the rate of change of volume with respect to pressure, namely the derivative dV dP. As P increases, V decreases, so dV dP is less than zero. The compressibility is defined by introducing a minus signing and dividing this derivative by the volume V. So, okay, the compressibility, beta is minus one over V, dV, derivative of V with respect to P. So yeah, if you have the volume as a function of the pressure, again, a differentiable function, then you can find dV, dP, no problem. So it's saying compressibility is dV, dP divided by V times minus one. Okay, so they give a formula for the volume as a function of pressure here. We can take dV, dP, no problem. And so that we're evaluating this when P is equal to 50. So dV, dP, but okay, so you get a function of P, right? You get V as a function of P. That's what, that's what, because you, you start with V of P. You take dV, dP, you have another function of P. So now plug in P is equal to 50, because that's where we're evaluating it, and we get this. That's dV, dP. Okay, so coming back to this formula, dV, dP, but what about this 1 over V? Well, V we know is 5.3 over P. We, so we plug in 5.3 over P here, put P is equal to 50, and you get the, the beta at P is equal to 50, and this was for, uh, this is for air, a sample of air at 25 degrees Celsius. Right, so it's all about having these differentiable functions that you can you can di differentiate. Right, you can get these experimentally, or sometimes they're found analytically, depending on, on on the problem. But underlying every one of these derivatives is a differentiable function. Remember that. Okay, let n equals a function of t be the number of individuals in an animal or plant population at time t. Okay, the number of individuals in an animal or plant population at time t. The change in the population size between times t is equal to t1 and t is equal to t2 is, okay, delta n is ft2 minus ft1. That's the change in the population size. And so the average rate of growth during the time period, okay, so delta n divided by delta t, that's the, the difference quotient, right? And so the instantaneous rate of rate of growth, just take the limit as delta t approaches zero of this difference quotient, okay? But, okay, take a look at this. Strictly speaking, this is not quite accurate because the actual graph of a population function would be a step function, right? It, 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 taken most literally, any, gr any truly true graph of a population is going to be, be just like this, a step function with these horizontal lines, Right, because it's either the it's what is it literally any any population of animals or, or or humans it's constant 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 someone dies or is born then it so it so it jumps or goes down constant 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 jumps go, jumps up or down here it's always jumping up 
I guess the net population is always increasing for what they're considering here, but, but that's a true population function. Well, that's not differentiable. At, at the discontinuities, it's not. So it's, it's differentiable away from the discontinuities, but it's still the derivative does, is useless because the derivative is either going to be, there is no, you can't take the derivative or the derivative is zero. Okay, but what they do is, in, in, for, in, for a lot of circumstances, you'll just get a curve fit. So you can imagine they take the center points of all of these, all the center points, and do a curve fit. What do you get? This smooth, differentiable curve that represents in this n, f of t, the population as a function of time. Well, now we, now we come back to this difference quotient. What is the average rate of growth? Delta n divided by delta t. Take any delta n divided by delta t. That's the average rate of the population growth. Take the limit as delta t approaches zero of that, of that difference quotient, and you have the derivative, d n d t. You can absolutely, if as long as, you know, what's the equation for this curve fit, you can take that derivative. It's going to be like a polynomial curve fit or whatever, whatever it is. This is differentiable. You just need its equation. And so they say that it says, to be more specific, consider a population of bacteria in a homogeneous nutrient medium. Suppose that by sampling the population at certain intervals, it is determined that the population density doubles every hour. So if the population doubled every hour, that's going to be an exponential function, like 2 to the x power, with, or 2 to the t. But you'll have this, it says here, this n naught, you, you have a starting value. So when t is equal to 0, 2 to the 0 is equal to 1, 1 times the starting value. Okay, now this is very simplified, this the doubling every hour. I mean, you could get, you could, you could do a, 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 a more elaborate curve fit than just this, but they're, they're just giving a simple example here. But this is a, this is a differentiable curve, right? We know how to differentiate exponentials. The, differ, the, the derivative of 2 to the x power is 2 to the x times natural log of 2. So that's what they do here. They, it's the derivative of this f, this n is n naught, because that's a constant, right? 2 to the t times natural log of 2. And so they can find the growth rate, which is defined to be this dn dt at any, at any moment in time, right? Because that, that's something that you might want to know. You want that, you know, in a lot of circumstances, you want that instantaneous rate of change, the rate of change at a, at a point, right? There's a lot of situations where, if we're in real life situations, where that's what, you're, that's, that's what you want. What was the rate of change in the population at the start of year three, right? You don't want to be saying, oh, well, the average rate of change from, in, in the, from the, you know, the start of year three to, the first, to one month into year three was this. No, no, no. Just what's the, at the start of year three, what was the rate of change of the population? Okay, that's dn dt, t is equal to three, if, assuming that t is in years. Okay, example seven. When we consider the flow of blood through a blood vessel, such as a vein or artery, we can model the shape of the blood vessel by a cylindrical tube with radius r and length l as illustrated in figure eight. So a cylindrical tube, that's the model of a blood vessel. Its length is l, its Overall radius is R. This R is a variable, so it represents the, the R position away from the center line. Okay, because of friction at the walls of the tube, the velocity V of the blood is greatest along the central axis of the tube and decreases as the distance R from the axis increases until V becomes zero at the wall, right? The, the blood, that, that's how, how flows work. It sticks to the walls. The relationship between V and R is given by the law of laminar flow discovered by the French physician Jean-Louis Marie Pasquale in 1840. This law states that, so what is this? This is the, the relationship between the velocity and R. So like the, velo the velocity of the blood is a function of, the pos of its position from the center. That's the idea. It's not like it's not like an even velocity over, over the entire area. It's a function of it. It's, it's radially symmetric. It's radially symmetric, but it, 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 the velocity of the blood flow varies as, as a function of, of R. And that's given by this here. So L is the length, the length here of the blood vessel. P is the, it says, the pressure difference between the ends of the tube. This 4 and this N is a constant. R squared is just the outer radius. That's a constant. And then there's R. R, the domain of R is zero to capital R. 
the average rate of change of the, of the velocity as we move from R is equal to R1 outward to R is equal to R2. The, the change in velocity, if you go from R2 to R1, VR2 minus VR1, that's this function here, VR2, V evaluated at R2 minus V evaluated at R1 divided by R2 minus R1. That's a difference quotient. If you let delta R approach zero, then you get, and you take the limit as delta, delta R approaches zero, you get the, the velocity gradient, right? DV, DR. You have, you have the delta V divided by delta R this, in this, you know, this most common form, this difference quotient form that, you, that you'll see scientific real-world phenomena represented as when you want to find a derivative, right? This difference quotient. You take the limit as the, the denominator, the delta R, or delta X, you know, the denominator approaches zero of that difference quotient, you get the derivative. Well, you have to have a differentiable function here to do this, do we? Absolutely. Boom. So you find dV dr. Now, this is assuming that you can't, the pressure can't be a function of r, the L can't be a function of r, right? And, and they make that assumption here. So if we come back, you can't have P be a function of r, well, th then that's not the right derivative. So assuming P is not a function of r, that L is not a function of r, none of this is a function of r, you just have r here, then this is the derivative. dV dr, and you find the derivative like you normally do. You treat everything else as a constant. Okay, so now with, it says for one of the smaller human arteries, you take this to be that N here. R, this R is the diameter or the, the radius, the overall radius of the blood vessel. L is 2. Here's P. And there's the, the velocity. But then they also find the velocity gradient at, that, at, at a certain R value. Okay? Last example, economics. Suppose... CX is the total cost that a company incurs in producing X units of a certain commodity, right? The total cost incurred when you're producing this many units of something. The, that's called a cost function, okay? If the number of items produced is increased from X1 to X2, then the additional cost is CX2 minus CX1, delta C. And the average rate of change of the cost is delta C divided by delta X. Now take the limit as delta X approaches zero and they call this the marginal cost, D, C, D, X. But check this out. Since X often takes on only integer values, right? Like the number of units produced, that's an integer value. It may not make literal sense to say, or, or to let delta X approach zero, right? Because delta X approaching zero is like, you know, 0 0.1, 0 0.01, 0 0.001, 0 0.0001. While well, we're talking about X is the number of units produced. That kind of doesn't seem to make sense. But we can always replace C of X by a smooth approximating function like we did with the population, which to me, I, to me, that's not, a, that, that makes sense. Like you can, like I'm, I wouldn't be, if I was, if someone was presenting something to me like a cost function to me like this, and they said, oh, the rate of change at, uh, of, of the cost, the, the marginal cost, so DC, DX at, at 100 units is 3.2. Oh, 3. Point, so I'm not going to freak out and think, well, 3. Point, how can we how can we make a fraction of a unit? No, that's just part of the, you know, like a half we can make an extra half a unit. Like it's just part of the that to me that's not that big of a deal. But okay, you can look at it kind of like this. Take delta x is equal to 1 and n is large, right? So we we delta x is equal to 1. That's the te technically technically that's the smallest delta x can be. And n large so that delta X is small compared to N, then C prime of N technically, like it, it, you can approximate it as C of N plus one minus C of N. Does that make sense? I still don't see the big deal of having a decimal. Like that, that's not a problem at all. That wouldn't be a problem for me as like a manager at all. Thus, the marginal cost of producing N units is approximately equal to the, the cost of producing one more unit, one more unit. Right, that's the literal idea of marginal cost. But it is often appropriate to represent a total cost function by polynomial. So there you go. That's nice and differentiable. And it talks about how these cost functions are determined. Like this is the, the, over, the overhead cost and there's other things. I'm not going to get into all that. But so here's a cost function. There you go. Take its derivative and you can get the marginal cost. So you take the derivative C prime 
at 500 is $15 per item. Now, to get the, the literal marginal cost, what they do is they, they take that polynomial, they say cost of, at f- of f- to produce 501 minus cost to produce 500, that's like the, the more of the technically correct marginal cost, right? We're still using that same polynomial. We're still using this polynomial, and that's 15.01. But the derivative, 15, and the actual, like, producing one more unit, that's, you know, that's plenty of the accuracy you need, right? C prime of 500 is approximately equal to C501 minus C500. Okay, rates of change occur in all the sciences. A geologist is interested in knowing the rate at which an intruded body of molten rock cools by conduction of heat into surrounding rocks. An engineer wants to know the rate at which water flows into or out of a reservoir. An urban geographer is interested in the rate of change of the population density in a city as the distance from the center, the city center increases. A meteorologist is concerned with the rate of change of atmospheric pressure with respect to height. In psychology, those interested in learning theory study the so-called learning curve, which graphs the performance P sub T of someone learning a skill as a function of the training time T. Of particular interest is the rate at which performance improves as time passes, that is, dp dt. In sociology, differential calculus is used in analyzing the spread of rumors or innovations or fads or fashions. If P sub T denotes the proportion of a population that knows a rumor by time T, then the derivative DP DT represents the rate of spread of the rumor. And so remember, underlying all of these derivatives they're talking about here are differentiable functions. In a lot of cases, it's going to be some curve fit you have, a, you have a bunch of data points. You, you want to have a lot of data points to work with. You could do curve fits, right? We talk about curve fitting in the, the statistics playlist. Get a really accurate curve fit, boom, smooth curve. You can find the derivative. Okay, now this last paragraph, a single idea, many interpretations. This is just talking about how, you know, abstract mathematical concepts can, because they're abstract, they can be applied all over science and engineering, as opposed to having to go to each field and, and develop math, math solutions for each field separately. If, if, they, if they do it properly in an abstract way, like, like, like calculus has done, then it can just be generally applied. Okay, so now let's work some example problems. And again, when we work these example problems, focus on how the calculus is being applied. But I know it's hard. It's hard when you don't understand what's the, the, the physics or the science behind what we're doing. It's hard to kind of get into the calculus as well. But don't get discouraged and feel like you, you don't understand what's going on because you don't understand the, the, the science principles, like the talking about psych- psychology or geology. Right. Don't confuse. Don't confuse not understanding that with not understanding the calculus.